Hey guys, I'm Russ Still with Gold Seal. I'm here at CNI, the Cherokee County Airport in North Georgia. It's near the Appalachian Mountains and is surrounded by some really rugged terrain. Off the end of runway five, there's nothing but trees, ravines, rocks, and some pretty impressive high tension power lines. It's a horrible place to lose an engine, but that's exactly what happened to me in July, 2019, about 75 seconds after takeoff. Frequently, takeoff safety doesn't get all the consideration it deserves. Did you know that over 20% of fatal accidents occur during the first three minutes after takeoff power is applied? That's right, on a clear VFR day, your first 90 seconds of flight is one of the most dangerous periods that you'll experience. Let me illustrate this. Imagine your last VFR flight. You got the weather information before you taxied. Hopefully, you wrote it down. At the run-up area, you followed your training and performed a perfect before takeoff checklist. Light controls, instruments, engine run-up, the whole deal. At the hold short line, you checked both directions looking for traffic before taxiing into takeoff position. Once lined up on the runway, the power went in, the takeoff roll began, and you checked the power instruments and airspeed indicator. Sounds like a great start to a fun flight, right? Well, there's one thing that was overlooked in this scenario. It's this piece of paper right here. This is your pre-takeoff emergency briefing. It's something that's guaranteed to massively reduce your risk and maybe even save your life. The trick is you have to brief it before every single takeoff. So your goal is to minimize your risk during the first 90 seconds of your flight. It starts the instant you push the throttle into takeoff power. This is when you're most highly exposed and don't have much time to react. Your mitigation lies in briefing in advance for problems. You want to be spring-loaded for safety. To see how this works, let's start out by dividing your takeoff procedure into four distinct sections. The takeoff roll, the rotation, the initial climb, and the departure climb. Every VFR takeoff in a general aviation single-engine airplane follows the same profile. It starts out when the throttle is pushed in. The first segment, the takeoff roll, is the lowest risk portion of the departure profile. You're still on the ground and problems are relatively easy to deal with. In most cases, the answer is simply to stop. We've color coded it white in this animation. Problems here allow you to abort the takeoff or more properly, reject it. A takeoff should be rejected for any number of reasons, including a loss of directional control, suspicious sounds or smells, of lack of power, or any roughness felt in the airframe. Once the airplane has rotated, you're in the air, and for a few seconds, you still may have enough runway in front of you to land in an emergency. Risk has increased to moderate. For any type of problem, your goal is to pitch down, reduce power, then quickly transition into a landing attitude and configuration. You have to be quick about it since the runway remaining in front of you is shrinking by the second. Your initial takeoff climb is where the highest risk occurs. There's no available runway in front of you and you're too low to do any significant maneuvering. This is where your highest degree of discipline has to kick in. If you have an engine failure in this portion of the profile, land straight ahead into an area shaped like a pie slice. When you're low, the pie slice is basically just a straight line, so your only option is literally straight in front of you. But with hundreds of feet of altitude, it starts to widen out slightly, giving you a few, and I stress the word few, more options. At a certain altitude in your climb, you will have reached a height above the ground where you'll have a lot more landing options available. This is generally called the decision height and is unrelated to the DH in an instrument approach. It's the altitude where your options increase dramatically. You have a very wide pie slice available, and if you're high enough, you may even be able to turn up to 180 degrees left or right to glide to your best landing option. It doesn't mean you can return to the airport, but it does mean you have more choices. During your departure climb, your risk has dropped back to moderate. Unless you've done some serious training and turn back maneuvers, consider your DH to be 1,000 feet AGL. This altitude should not be considered a safe altitude for a turn back to the runway. This is unrelated to the impossible turn, a name that I really don't like anyway. That's a different topic with a lot of significant factors. This 1,000 foot DH is simply the point where you can remain vigilant and breathe a little easier knowing that the altitude has reduced your risk and increased your options. 
Okay, time to review. So far, we've seen that the first 90 seconds of flight is an especially dangerous period, but we can mitigate it or reduce our risk using a simple pre-takeoff emergency briefing. Make this a standard part of every takeoff. The briefing covers the four phases of the departure profile. Each phase has different risks and different mitigations. We brief it every time because we want to be locked and loaded. We want the information fresh in our minds. We should always launch expecting the worst to happen, knowing that we're ready to react. No seat of the pants flying. We know our options and are ready to execute them. The emergency briefing should be broken up into five parts. First is the review. This is an overview laying out the facts such as wind speed and wind direction, runway length, and any obstructions. The review identifies the variables unique to each takeoff. With that info in mind, the pilot goes over the remaining four sections of the departure profile. The goal is to get this information freshly implanted so that it can be recalled quickly. The four phases are the takeoff roll, the rotation point with runway remaining, the initial climb, and with adequate altitude, the departure climb. The briefing card summarizes the most basic emergency actions you must take for each phase. During phase one, identify the problem and stop. It's pretty simple, but the goal is for you to be already thinking about this. During phase two, you must transition from a climb profile back to a landing profile in just a couple of seconds. You have a finite amount of runway remaining, so you need to be ready. The nose has to come down quickly, but not too quickly. Pitch down, kill the power, and land. Phase three is the most dangerous part of the profile. Available runway is all behind you. If you have a problem here, your only option is to land in a narrow pie slice straight ahead. You don't have enough altitude for anything else, and don't even think about turning back to the runway. In this phase, whether you're trained for it or not, a turn back is likely to result in your death. Maintain control and land roughly straight ahead. Once you're high enough, generally 1,000 feet AGL, your pie slice has widened dramatically. This is the departure phase. The higher you are, the more options you have. Pick the best one, preferably into the wind, prepare for an off-airport landing, and keep flying until the airplane has completely stopped on the ground. So this was my briefing for my Cessna Skylane. You can certainly use it to model your own, but you do need to create one, and it needs to address each of the four phases of departure as a separate item. Let's remember that when you fly safe, you fly with less stress. And when you fly smart, you cover all your bases in advance. So get your head in the game before every takeoff. Make your pre-takeoff emergency briefing a habit. And don't just droll through it. Concentrate. Say every item out loud and don't fly by the seat of your pants. Be spring-loaded for safety.